final item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 12723 in the name of Margaret McDougall on awareness of Group B streptococcus. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. Um, Margaret, if you are ready, if you would like to open the debate, seven minutes please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Firstly, can I thank all the members who have supported my motion and those who are speaking in the debate this evening. I'd also like to thank Jane Plum of Group B Strep Support Charity for her briefing. The campaign to introduce Group B Streptococcus or GBS testing was first brought to my attention in 2013 through Jackie Watt from Cowinning, the grandmother of baby Lola, who tragically died after contracting Strep B shortly after her birth at Cross House Hospital. I'm delighted to say that Lola's parents, Tracy and Stephen, now have two beautiful daughters, Brooke and Ellie, who are both thriving. I'd like to congratulate Jackie Watt for her stoic campaign to raise awareness of GBS and to have testing offered in Scotland. Jackie's petition, Awareness of Strep B in Pregnancy and Infants, is currently being considered by the Scottish Parliament's Petition Committee. GBS is the most common cause of life-threatening infection in newborn babies and it lives normally without causing symptoms in human intestines and genital tracts. But it can be passed from mother to baby at the delivery stage of labour and unsurprisingly is the single biggest risk factor for a newborn baby. Given this, you might have thought public awareness would be high. However, as my motion states, this is not the case and there is a lack of public awareness regarding GBS and the effects it can have on newborn babies. In the UK, it has been estimated that Strep B infects over 500 babies a year. Sadly, 50 babies die as a result of contracting Strep B and around 30 suffer lifelong physical and mental disabilities. The charity Group B Strep Support have found that incidents of early onset GBS are higher in Scotland than in the rest of the UK and that the Scottish rate has increased from 12 in the year 2000 to 25 in 2014. This may seem like a small number, but in my view, even one is too many, when it is preventable and can be identified through a relatively simple and inexpensive test costing around £15 in the private sector. Indeed, 22 developed countries, including the USA, Canada, Germany and Spain, offer routine testing for GBS at 35 to 37 weeks of pregnancy. I have recently discovered that in the UK around 60% of obstetric units are offering testing to some or all pregnant women, while 76% are carrying out tests at the mother's request. Despite this, the fact that the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists does not recommend routine testing. However, the Scottish Government is not bound by this approach and is free to issue whatever guidance they may wish. Routine screening of GBS has proven to be effective. For example, in the US, where screening was introduced in 1996, rates fell from 1 to 0 0.24 per 1,000 live births in 2013. The University of Birmingham carried out studies into the cost of effectiveness of introducing routine screening for GBS, and they found that £427,000 would be saved for every baby death avoided, and £32,000 would be saved per infection avoided. These figures are, of course, estimates and will vary. However, other cost-benefit analyses have found screening is more cost-effective than risk based approaches. Given the current financial pressures on the NHS, can I ask the Minister to say in her summing up whether the Scottish Government will consider carrying out its own cost-benefit analysis to see how much could be saved by adopting routine testing? 
I do understand that there are some concerns around testing, such as the safety of using antibiotics during pregnancy, the willingness of patients to accept testing, and the enriched culture medium or ECM test not being reliable. However, the recommended antibiotic used is penicillin, which is narrow spectrum safe and effective against GBS. Most people know if they have a penicillin allergy and can be offered an alternative. On the criticism of the ECM test not being reliable, it is correct to state that it isn't 100% accurate and indeed it won't identify which babies will develop early onset GBS infection. However, it's much better than relying on risk factors alone, which is the current guidance, and it is highly predictive of GBS carriage status when done properly within five weeks of delivery. Essentially, we must remember ECM is a test to identify risk, not to diagnose a condition. Trusts such as Guernsey and North West London hospitals offer universal screening, and this has been welcomed by patients and health professionals alike. Previous surveys on screening have also found that health professionals want to be able to offer antenatal testing for Group B strep using ECM tests, while women would like it to be offered, and where universal screening has been introduced, infection rates have notably fallen. To conclude, presiding officer, I hope today I have laid out a firm argument as to why routine GBS testing should be offered by the NHS in Scotland. It is, as studies have shown, cost effective and on every piece of data, universal testing has been proven to dramatically reduce incidences, while risk-based testing seems to see an increase in incidences. In my view, the guidance from the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists has been overtaken by events, with more and more maternity units offering testing regardless of the guidelines, or indeed, as I've said earlier, introduced universal screening. Given that the Scottish Government is not bound by this Government, I urge the Scottish Government to introduce updated guidelines so there is no consistency and standardised care across all hospitals and expectant mothers can be confident they are receiving accurate information about GBS and whether they can be offered routine testing or be given information on how testing can be assessed privately. And I would also like to ask the Scottish Government if they will consider carrying out a cost-benefit analysis to find out what the benefits of that would be, so that no other family will have to suffer the trauma experienced by the parents of baby Lola. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call on Dennis Robertson to be followed by Rhoda Grant. Four minutes <coughs> or thereby, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And can I thank uh, Margaret McDougall for bringing this, I think, very important debate to the Chamber this evening. The death of any child, presiding officer, is very traumatic uh, for the parent, especially at a time when we should be in a state of joy and celebration. I cannot imagine what it would be like to have a newborn or a small infant die when everyone else is, is hoping, as I say, to celebrate. It must have been a dreadful situation for the parents of Lola and certainly it is something that, if preventable, then it is something we should perhaps try to ensure that it is so. Margaret McDougall says that the current evidence has suggested or has been overtaken to some extent from the Royal College of Obstetrician and Gynaecologists. Presiding officer, in uh, looking at their website, I note that the Royal College um, had another evidence-based uh, treatment, well, not treatment, evidence-based session to look at, or survey, to look at uh, this whole I, uh, aspect of GBS. And they concluded just in December 2014 that the situation should remain the same, that there should be no routine screening. 
I find this strange to some extent, given that they were updating, obviously, the information. And if it is felt, as Margaret Murdugo has said, that there is a benefit, not just to, obviously, the families who are expecting a, a lovely newborn, but obviously to the baby who will actually suffer the consequences of strep B. The consequences for the newborn baby aren't particularly nice, presiding officer. And for some, uh, it can lead to uh, a meningitis, which can cause uh, deafness, blindness, uh, and other symptoms. Now, sometimes these are short-lived, but I dare say for the parents with that young baby, they're going through a very traumatic and, anxiety, uh, and full of anxiety at the time, not knowing if their little baby is going to live or not. Presenting officer, there is a risk. There is a risk. And we've got to be mindful of the risk. And if the clinicians are stating that there is a risk to carrying out this process routinely, then perhaps we should listen. However, they also state that in the high risk categories, there isn't a problem with actually going ahead with the screening. I think we should maybe be looking at the criteria of what is high risk and what isn't. And again, ensuring that if parents have the information available to them, and this is crucial, that they need the information available to them, so that maybe parents can be informed and make that choice. And I do believe, presiding officer, that there are occasions when parents' choice is perhaps better than clinical choice. And I think if the expected parents believe that it is in their interest and the interest, and the interest of their newborn baby or the baby to be born, then that test should be carried out. So I hope, in, in conclusion, when the minister is summing up, that may be taken to cognizance parent choice against clinical choice. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. I now call on Rhoda Grant to be followed by Dr Nanette Milne. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I congratulate Margaret Dugo for securing the debate? It's vital that we keep reassessing our approach to conditions like GBS and their prevention in order that Scottish patients receive the most appropriate treatment. In Scotland, patients are screened for GBS infection if they are deemed to be at risk. However, a number do fall through the net, and this can have terrible consequences. A child who contracts GBS is at risk of death or disability. This must be heartbreaking for the mother, knowing that a bacterium that she carried, largely harmless to herself, has caused a problem for her child. And that's why we need to continue to reassess how we deal with this condition. There's also an ongoing cost to the state, estimated at 67 million by the 2007 Health Technology Assessment Study. Many more cases of GBS infection in newborn babies could be prevented by routine screening to identify all women actually carrying GBS rather than using the current strategy of screening those with risk factors, but who may not actually be carrying GBS. The test itself doesn't carry a risk, However, there are concerns about its accuracy and the fear that routine testing could lead to many thousands of women being offered antibiotics they don't need. And the use of antibiotics in pregnancy and labour are sub the subject of increased concern and current UK guidance recommends against unnecessary use. But studies in the US have shown that antibiotics carry a risk in pregnancy only when they're broad spectrum rather than the recommended narrow spectrum antibiotics that are used here for GBS infection, as Margaret mentioned in her speech. There are concerns about antibiotics causing a, a negative effect both on mother and baby, but those have mostly been disproven. More widely, there's concerns about growing antibiotic resistance due to their overuse, which rightly leads to reluctance to prescribe unless it's absolutely necessary. But that said, when lives are at stake, surely this should be used. 
There are concerns that the test can only tell if a woman is carrying GBS, not if their unborn baby will become unwell, and testing can't completely predict which mothers will or will not have GBS by the time they go into labour. Up to 49,000 women per year whose tests would say they have GBS will actually be clear by the time they give birth, and conversely, up to 43,000 per year of those women whose tests came back clear might actually be carrying GBS by the time they go into labour. Therefore, those who needed no treatment could be unnecessarily treated, while those who tested clear could be given false, a false sense of security. That said, as a result of the screening programmes, a number of GBS infections in newborn babies has fallen significantly in other countries. In the USA, by over 80%, in Spain, by 80, over 86%, Australia, 82%, and France, by nearly 72%. However, in the UK, where routine screening for GBS is not offered, the incidence has increased, leaving more babies exposed to this life-threatening illness. Therefore, it may be that a number of approaches need to be taken in order to offer the greatest protection, possibly routine screening combined with retesting if risk factors are present. Presiding officer, it's a complex issue, but at its heart is a safe delivery of healthy babies, and we can't be complacent. We need to learn from other countries where they have succeeded in saving lives and preventing disability. I therefore urge the Scottish Government to look again at the issue to ensure that we are offering the best care for unborn babies. Many thanks. I now call on Dr Nanette Milne to be followed by Margaret McCulloch. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I too would like to commend Margaret McDougall for bringing this important but difficult issue to the attention of Parliament and for gaining cross-party support for her motion. As we've heard, Group B streptococcal infection is an uncommon, though potentially very serious and indeed life-threatening infection of neonates and young infants. In the first week of life for early onset infection and up to around 90 days for late onset. Strep B is a bacterium which lives in the gut or vagina and sometimes in the back of the nose and throat. It's usually harmless to the person carrying it. And of the 20 to 30 percent of pregnant women estimated to be carriers, 99 percent of their babies are born without any health complications. Very rarely, GBS infects a newborn baby through transmission from the vagina during labour. And this is symptomised by the baby being lethargic, not feeding well, being irritable, or with abnormally high or low temperature heart rate or respiratory rate, and their blood pressure may be low. Around 60, per 7, 60 to 70 per cent of GBS infection is early onset, developing within the first seven days of life. When the diagnosis is made, speedy treatment with antibiotics, usually penicillin, is very effective. Late onset infection occurs after the first week and up to around 90 days and usually causes meningitis, which again may be treated very successfully when diagnosed. But sadly, there are a, number of, a small number of babies who suffer very serious consequences like deafness, blindness or brain damage and a few who will die of complications. So GBS, while it very rarely causes significant harm, has to be taken very seriously. And parents and the people looking after pregnant mums should keep it in the back of their mind in the later stages of gestation. And so, as we know to this end, the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists has drawn up guidelines um, for the prevention, uh, on the prevention of early onset uh, neonatal GBS and has also produced educational material for patients and their care. NHS boards have also produced circulars detailing the main risk factors um, I've seen as an example the information circulated to all staff and managers involved in obstetrics by Forth Valley in 2013. And it is detailed in its guidance on the prevention of early onset GBS and on the management of babies born to mothers with it. Nonetheless, the Group B Strep Support Charity has claimed that there's a poor understanding of GBS by midwives and other professionals. And they claim that countries with a national screening programme, and we know there are several, have lowered the rate of infection and their demands for routine screening are based on the experience of these other countries. That's why I said, presiding officer, at the outset that we are this evening discussing a difficult issue because the UK National Screening Committee, which gives expert advice on screening issues to the NHS and ministers in all four parts of the UK, advised in 2012 against a national GBS screening programme for pregnant women on the grounds that the benefits of such a programme wouldn't outweigh harm. And this advice was repeated again last year. <coughs> Several reasons are given for the recommendations, and I think it's worth repeating them. But many women carry strep B, and most of their babies are born safely and without infection. 
Screening all women in late pregnancy cannot predict which babies will develop a GBS infection. Moreover, testing is not reliably accurate and false negatives are possible, with carriers testing negative and most babies who are severely affected by GBS infection are usually born prematurely before the suggested time for screening. Finally, a large number of women carriers at very low risk would get unnecessary treatment and the overuse of antibiotics may well lead to the development of antimicrobial resistance, which, as we know, is a serious problem for the modern NHS. Presiding officer, I have a great deal of sympathy with the concerns of the people who are seeking screening for pregnant women, because to have a badly infected baby is one of the worst nightmares a mum can have. But I also understand that governments have to rely on their expert advisors to give them the right information before they embark on new regimes. Equally, I have no doubt that those who are lobbying for a change of heart will continue to make their very valid case and that experts will revisit their decision and look at the facts again in future years to see if there are any new factors which might change their opinion. But to me, the most important thing to be done at the present time is to ensure that all concerned are made aware of GBS and that steps are taken to reinforce that awareness on a regular basis by whatever are considered to be the most effective means in a 21st century society. Thankfully, GBS infection is not common, but one serious complication or death is one too many, and I'm sure we'll all agree with that. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Margaret McCulloch, after which we move to the closing speech of the Minister. Thank you, President Officer. In beginning my contribution this evening, I'd like to congratulate my colleague Margaret McDougall for securing this debate on awareness of Group B strep. Indeed, I want to commend all those members who have highlighted this issue in some way over the last four years. Margaret McDougall, Rhoda Grant, Nanette Milne and Kenny Gibson. And I also want to pay tribute to Jane Plum, Jane Pum, Chief Executive of Group B Strep Support, and Jackie Watt for their passion and persistence in raising awareness about this bacterium and the risk it poses to the youngest infants in Scotland and babies yet to be born. They have been pursuing this issue through the Public Petitions Committee, arguing the case for a more comprehensive screening and asking challenging but always fair and informed questions of the Scottish Government and the health professions. Equally, the Committee has received some valuable and useful evidence from the Government and others highlighting existing practice and the work that is already underway to address Group B strep. There is an important debate underway as to how we prevent this bacteria leading to infection and illness in newborn. Illnesses which can put precious young lives at risk. Why are so many mothers unaware of strep B? Is our approach to strep B out of kilter and with some out of kilter with some of our nearest neighbours like the Republic of Ireland? Why don't we test and screen more women? Why do we test and are we testing them in the right way? These are the issues we need to grapple with this. At yes, on you go. Dennis Roberts. I apologise to the member. Um, but a, a brief intervention, uh, obviously uh, making um, parents uh, aware is, is paramount as well. Does the member agree with me that the, the Scottish Government is listening to the Petitions Committee and is revisiting the information on the Ready Steady Baby? Uh, and that's to be welcomed. Um, well, if, if that's what the government's doing, then I welcome that. Yeah, I think that's really important. But I think there's also issues that women really who are pregnant are not aware of strep B, and they're also not aware that it can actually damage the babies really seriously. And if they can't get it tested through NHS, then they can actually go and do it privately as well. And that information is on the... Um, the Public Petitions Committee website, but not everybody actually accesses that information and knows it's there. So, presiding officer, Group B strep can be present in many women and it can go unnoticed without, ha without causing any harm and without any symptoms manifesting at all. However, for pregnant women, strep B can be a cause of bacterial infection in their newborn babies. In the UK, around 340 babies develop an early onset GBS infection. Most babies who are infected can be treated successfully. They will go on to make a full recovery and have a healthy and happy infancy. And as says before, but for some, the infection can be much more serious. It can lead to septicemia, pneumonia and meningitis, and it can be life-threatening. Some of those babies will never fully recover. 
They could live for the rest of their lives with blindness or deafness, learning disabilities or cerebral palsy. Others will die. What concerns me about the level of early onset GBS infections is that it has remained static in the rest of the UK, but as the motion sets out in Scotland, the rate has actually risen. This is not a huge number of cases, but as I've explained, the consequences can be devastating. It seems logical that the Scottish Government should therefore consider the merits of arguments being presented by people like Jackie Watt. Her concern is that cases are slipping through the net because our approach concentrates on women who are affected by certain risk factors. They might experience cert certain illnesses in their pregnancy or they might have their child prematurely. She would also advocate following the example of other developed countries where women are screened more generally and antibiotics are administered more widely. We don't want to provide intravenous drips to anyone if it can be avoided, but best practice from elsewhere suggests that administering antibiotics to more mothers helps prevent early onset infections. We want to follow the best medical advice from bodies such as the UK National Screening Committee, but equally we could test more women. It was suggested in evidence to Public Petitions Committee that clinicians in Scotland could be ahead of the curve in supporting more women to be tested. However, questions were raised about whether testing is equally robust enough, given that we do not have a consistent set of guidelines to direct a more general approach to testing. I simply put it to the Government that the recorded increase in incidences of infection should focus minds and allow us to take a closer look at how we reduce the risk of GBS to the health of newborns. Presiding Officer Margaret McDougall and the Strep B campaigners have brought an issue of the utmost importance to this Parliament. We must hear the voices of those campaigners. We must interrogate the evidence before us and we must do all we can to protect the next generation. Thank you. Thank you. And we now move to closing speech from the Minister. Maureen Watts, seven minutes or thereby, Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And I'd like to thank everyone in the Chamber today for their contribution to this debate and the points raised. Many members have raised very valid points and in many cases, like uh, Rhoda Grant and Annette Milne, actually answered uh, the, the own points that they raised. It is without doubt distressing that all involved when a baby dies... Uh, Dress, sorry, it is without doubt distressing to all involved when a baby dies, and I'd like to express my deepest sympathies to the families affected by this infection. I'd also like to reassure all in this Parliament today that the Scottish Government is absolutely committed to quality, safety and person-centred care of mother and babies in the NHS throughout Scotland. Care is based on best practice and guidelines underpinning use within the NHS. These are not developed in isolation. They are as a, as a result of consideration of the best available evidence. As many of you here tonight are aware, evidence on Group B Streptococcus was extensively reviewed in November 2012 by the UK National Screening Committee. This independent expert advisory group used all the available medical evidence of the risks and benefits of screening all pregnant women. Indeed, the evidence base examined was the largest the NSC has been required to look at and also included extensive comments from interested groups and members of the public via a public consultation. This committee agreed that a national screening programme for Group B streptococcus should not be introduced and the NHS in Scotland is following this advice. Um, I'm sure that members would agree that all work that we do should be evidence-based and we must listen to professionals. But of course, if the evidence change and the advice of the professional change, of course, governments will respond to that. Many of you are aware of the reasons stated for this position, amongst which are that testing cannot completely predict which mothers will or will not have group B streptococcus by the time they go into labour. And as Nanette Mill pointed out, you can have it at one point in time, but not later on. And similarly, you can have it not later on um, and then develop it later. So the estimates suggest that between 13,000 and 49,000 women each year who test would say that they have group B streptococcus will actually be clear of the virus by the time they give birth. 
So just to clarify, 17,000 to 25,000 pregnant women in the UK would need to be treated with prophylactic antibiotics each year to prevent one death from Group B streptococcus. This is approximately 1 in 30 pregnant women. Yes. Dennis Roberts. I, I thank the Minister for taking the intervention. Um, would the Minister agree with me that perhaps the reducing the anxiety with the parents, um, it may be better to test than the risk to the unborn child through high anxiety of the expectant mother? Maureen Watt. Yes, I'll, I'll come on to the point that Dennis Robertson uh, raises. So we need to be absolutely clear that screening is not a risk-free option. There are implications which I'm sure you're all familiar with, including microbial resistance to antibiotics and the risk to some women of allergic reaction to antibiotics in pregnancy. And I'm sure all women who have been pregnant will know that they don't want to take any drugs during pregnancy that they don't actually need. Another point I'd like to pick up on is the introduction to this chamber of various statistics around the rate of infection in Scotland. And I'd like to caution against this, given these infections are not notifiable under the terms of the Public Health Scotland Act 2008. Surveillance of streptococcal B infection in Scotland is based on laboratory confirmed reports received through the electronic reporting system called ECOSS, which stands for Electronic Communication of Surveillance in Scotland. Whilst there are limitations with this data, particularly prior to 2009 when ECOS had not been fully impl implemented, the figures show that the number of laboratory confirmed reports of Group B streptococcal infections, including early and late onset infections, has not changed significantly in the last six years. Despite all of what I've said, though, I can categorically state that I do agree with everybody that a death, even of one baby, is one too many. And that is why I'm reassured that there is a programme of research underway to develop improved practices in the management of potential Group B streptococcal infection. These research studies include looking at appropriate rapid identification methods. As much of this research is due to com be completed around the end of this year, it is hoped that the NSC will be in a position to evaluate the case for a screening programme with the most, most up-to-date evidence later this year or early next year. I'm also reassured that we are developing better communications for pregnant women on this issue, as Nanette Mill said in her very valuable contribution and as Dennis Robertson has uh, just indicated. <clears throat> an example is the Ready Steady Baby, which is an informative booklet, website and mobile, mobile phone app for expectant mothers. This source of information, uh, which was funded by the Scottish Government and given to all expectant families in Scotland, has recently been updated to include two sections on Group B streptococcus. And I think it is exactly this, presiding officer, about having the conversation between clinicians, matern midwives, um, maternity nurses, uh, and the families about the risks. You know, there will be families where the risk is higher, for example, in mothers who've previously given birth to a baby who's had the infection, uh, women who um, have high temperatures or other systems, uh, symptoms of infection during uh, labour, women who've had urinary tract or vi vaginal infections. So I think we need to have that conversation. We need to make women more aware of the risks especially if they've had uh, these kind of system, uh, symptoms and um, that they have the conversation about whether uh, testing and um, medication is, ne is necessary. So I would like to conclude by saying that while I freely accept that progress, is in, that progress in practice around this infection may not be moving fast enough for some, I would like to assure the Chamber that progress is being made and that I will maintain a keen interest in ensuring that the best possible evidence is put into practice for the mothers and babies of Scotland. Thank you. And thank you, and thank you all for taking part in this important debate. And I now close this meeting of Parliament.